this is a, an earlier version of the book, and it was revised before it was printed. So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. Can you next page? Okay, good. All right, so what I'm going to try to do here is convert the the tometry analytic into structures that are obtainable as physical entities, and then show how those structures tell us uh, about the mass and energy values of particles. Now, this hasn't been done in physics. We we know in physics what the values are. We know the um, uh, the uh, electron volts of the electron, and we know that of the protons and all the other particles, but we don't know why those numbers are there. So this is going to explain why those numbers are there, and it's all based on loops and the twist that's put into those loops. And the, the discovery back in uh, 2000, in fact, it was the day before 2000, um, I was looking at the Zerpinski triangle fractal, which you see here. And I transposed the three loops of the simplest form of field structure, which is this uh, uh, tetrahedron form, made with three different loops, uh, blue, red, and yellow. And I thought, well, if, if this explains something, if that structure explains something, then it's got to be able to be transferred to uh, what physics has found. And so in taking a look at this uh, Sierpinski fractal here, at the very, very top, is a tiny little triangle. So it has three lines. Those are the three lines that are in this structure. This is, uh, the Sierpinski is a diagram. It's not a structure. This is the structure. And so I'm transposing the three lines here into this um, fractal. And that's the top little triangle. So that's the first iteration of this triangle. Then I multiplied that three to get the second iteration, which has three of these triangles uh, at the top. So that means that now, instead of three loops, I have now nine loops in this top little triangle. And then I iterated that again to get the uh, third iteration. And so it's gone from three loops at the top to nine loops. And now it's at 27 loops, nine times three. And as we go up, uh, adding, adding the next uh, fractal, uh, <clears throat> we now have 81 loops, which are the, each line of those little triangles added together, the uh, third iteration has 81. And in that way, can you pull it down, uh, shift down now? Yeah, there. So uh, there we see how it how it goes. First iteration, 3, 9, 27, 81, 243, 729. And the seventh iteration is 2187. And then I took a look at the mass of particles in the first generation of particles and found out that 2187 is the has the same mass number as a lambda particle and so the lambda particle which is heavier than a proton a proton is 1836 loops and 
so what I was interested in is this ratio, how this thing increases, does it match how particles increase in their mass? And it does. So each one of these stops here, each one of these iterations is the mass in terms of uh, an electron mass of the different particles. And uh, here I'm explaining how these loops uh, uh, interact. And I have a table that goes more into this as we go along. Uh, drop down, drop, next page. Okay. Now, before going, uh, let's see, better go back up a little bit. Yeah, there. Um, before going into actually looking at each particle and counting the number of loops in it and to see how that matches up with the ratios of um, uh, that physics has found, uh, I want to go into how to look at these loops. So a loop can be insided looped or outsided loop. In other words, if you have a loop, you can do two things with it. You can continue looping it, as we see here, and you can twist that loop. Those are the two things that you can do. And it turns out, so adding loops is adding mass and Twisting adds energy, and the equation equals mc squared is embodied in this form. The number of uh, loops is uh, three, and the energy of this would be the number of loops squared, which is uh, nine. So given you can do these two things, uh, Let's move down another page. I'm taking a look here at what, what a loop can do. And it can rotate uh, and it can uh, it, it can rotate about a central axis, which is the center of the loop and the loop itself can rotate. Uh, so a loop can rotate about its axis and uh, twist and show shown is the left-handed clockwise rotation in red and the right-handed clockwise rotation in black. And where does all this rotation come from? The loop is actually a uh, diagram of how electromagnetic energy works. There's, there's, there's two aspects to electromagnetic energy, which is light and all the other forms. It has uh, uh, a, uh, an electric component and a magnetic component. And those two things are the nature of electromagnetic energy. It, it has uh, a force in a line and around that is wrapped a uh, an electro uh, on a magnetic field. So here, what I'm showing is a loop. Uh, can you see my cursor, by the way? I guess you um, can. I'm not. I'm not seeing your cursor. Can oh, you see it? All right, then I'll just have to talk about it. Um. <laughs> If you want me to point to it, I... well, yes. If you could interpret what I'm yeah. saying, yeah, that, that'd be tough. So, given the fact that electromagnetic energy has these two motions and they're uh, at cross with each other, one is going this way and the other is going around it this way, and that's that's the reason uh, that polarized light works is you filter out one and just see the other it's there but you don't see it so an electromagnetic wave is right and left-handed rotations and they're going in opposite directions and uh, we're going to have to get into eventually 
why is it that we only see one rotate one direction we don't see both directions we don't, don't see backwards in time we see forwards in time and there's a reason for that and it has to do with these rotating uh energies that are involved in light now uh when you take a look at how are you going to express this this duality of electric and magnetic impulses in one form. Uh, on figure five, I have two different loops, black and a white one. And um, this, this is an electromagnetic uh, uh, wave that is uh, static. It's not a, a kinetic wave, it's a potential wave. And I'll get into how you make this kinetic in a, in a moment. But what I want you to um, look here is uh, the fact that we're dealing with two motions. And they're, one is right-handed, one is left-handed, one is clockwise, one is anti-clockwise. And they are bound together. They're entangled into the same loop. Now, the picture I'm showing here shows that the black and the white loops are separate entities. So in physics, you call this a fermion um, loop, whereas an electromagnetic loop is actually a boson loop, which means they both are in the same domain, yet they're not interfering with each other. Um, boson and fermion are basic phys physical concepts. So uh, now, now that we've established that energy, electromagnetic energy, is made of two things, these two things can either deploy or condense. And what what I mean by that is, uh, can you shift down to page five? Oh, well, there's a lot of, a lot of. Let's 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 go down. Let's keep going. I want to go to uh, an illustration. This all can be read in, in read later in a book. It's uh, looking at things. Let's see. Okay, stop there for a moment. What I showed in the first presentation was how these loops, when they are knotted together, and this form here is a true three-dimensional knot, and the forms that you see that are talked about in string theory and topology uh, are always speaking about a single loop making a knot. I think I have a good illustration about that here. Hold on. Did I bring it out? Uh, I don't I don't see it right off. Um, if if you kind of look at look at this, uh, you can see that topology is dealing with a single loop and, and exploring all the ways that that single loop can knot itself. And uh, knot theory is quite interesting. And there's something, the number of possible knots are in the millions, um, but none of them define space. Uh, this is a knot that defines space because that's the tetrahedron. It, it defines a tetrahedron. And a, um, a, a trifold knot is a one-dimensional knot in three-dimensional space, but it doesn't define space. So uh, let's see, uh, can we move down? So here I'm showing uh, uh, 
various loops, uh, figure seven, A, B, and C are just showing how you can keep looping. And what uh, is shown down below is uh, three, five, seven, showing a single line doing these various loops. Shift down. Next page. Okay, oop. go back there to that chart. There we go. Um, so here again, I'm showing that the Zerpinski uh, triangle fractal is defining these forms by the number of loops they have. For instance, a um, a uh, dodecahedron or a chi uh, icosahedron has six, each of those have six loops. And um, so if you know the number of loops, you know what three-dimensional form, what polyhedra you're talking about. So every polyhedra has a unique signature of the number of loops. And if you're going to apply this to physical reality, then you're looking at the number of loops in a structure and transposing that, that ratio between 9, 27, 81, 243. You would look into the table of particles and see how many electron masses it are in each of these different particles. And when physics first started doing that, they were using the electron as the base one because they didn't think there was anything smaller than an electron. Now we found out there are things smaller, there's neutrinos. But the, the fact that this progression is the same ratio of progression that you find in, in physics in determining the mass of these different particles, you've got a one-to-one -one correspondence here. Uh, let's go down. Okay. I, I'm just reluctant to read all of this because it's... Um, it just it would just take too long. So keep going down to another illustration. It just really pains me that I can't open that this darn book <laughs> myself. Okay. Um, here we're going to look at. Uh, a property of loops. And if we look at a loop with a knot on it, uh, we see that that knot cannot be removed from that loop without cutting the loop open. Uh, but you can do something else with it. And page 10. Okay, stop there. Uh, now go back up a little bit. I want to point out something here. Yeah, keep going. Stop. There we go. Okay, there, there are loop families. And what that means is the loops organize themselves into degrees of condensement. So if you start with the maximum condensed loop in, in our physical universe, you're talking about a form called quark, which is uh, uh, a term in the standard model for the components of a proton. And quarks uh, are maximally condensed uh, to the tightest knot you can make. Remember the loop? with the knot on it, the, the scrunchiest knot you can make is called a quark. And the, um, 
the spark is the not form that the electron takes and the larks are forms that the neutrino takes so each form represents a platform of structure all right shift uh, down uh, well, that's the form that I've been holding up here, uh, but without the colored uh, loops. Keep going. Sure. Uh, uh, let's let's go down further. All right, stop, stop there. Let's see. Can we go back up a little bit? Absolutely. No problem. Okay, that's good. Now, in, in physics, they they start. Uh, there there are three generations of particles, and no one knows why this is. But they they found these particles and they fit into three different generations. Each one is the same as the one before it, but at larger energies. So the first generation is where all the normal particles that we have uh, in the universe that's, that's making us up here is in that first generation. It goes in in uh, the standard model, it goes from neutrino, electron, to the proton. And that's considered the first generation. I consider it the second generation, that the neutron uh, sequence has the same seven iterations that the electron sequence has. And... Um, And and these are known by the energies that they have. So uh, in the electron sequence, you have three basic tiers. You have the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the ta neutrino. And if you put three of these ta neutrinos into the structure, then you get an electron. So an electron is composed of three ta neutrinos and uh and in the electron sequence you have electron muon and ta and those are different energies so the electron is the the base uh particle for uh what the standard model is calling the first generation the muon is the base particle for the second generation and the ta is the base particle for the third generation. But the energies of these are wildly different. And um, uh, the energy, of the, uh, the mass of the uh, electron is, let's say it's one, the uh, tau neutrino is something like 700 masses larger than the electron. So these, these are all can be uh, explained in the loop hierarchy. Uh, all right, let's go down some more. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Um, unit of measurement article. Take take that all the way so we can see the whole thing. Sure. Oop. Now it's, let's yeah, it's, it's, Maybe it's, my it's kind of tricky. So Maybe let me try. Yeah. yeah. There we are. OK. So I mentioned that in field structure theory, the first generation of particles is that neutrino sequence ending in the Ta particle, which has 2,187 loops. But the Ta uh, 
means there the top plus designation means that there are three of those and and that is the same thing as an electron uh, a single ta has 729 and so three of them have 2187 loops now this is just oh this is hard to explain but the second generation uh, of particles is the electron sequence begins with three tau neutrinos, um, which is the electron, and interacts to produce, th those interact to produce the electron. The electron in the electron sequence has the mass value of one loop. So each, each these three uh, loops are each a tau neutrino. And three of them together gives us this form that is the electron. So it's loops pro producing in the hierarchy bigger loop configurations. And uh, this progression uh, keeps going. So uh, a big problem in physics, particle physics, is if you're using the electron as your base one, why does the proton have 1,136 electron masses plus a fraction of 157, da, 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 da. Where did that fraction come from? If the electron is what's building the hierarchy, it should all be in even numbers, but all of the particles above the electron have fractional values. And the question's been, well, where the heck did those, those fractions come from? It may seem trivial, but it's a big deal in physics to, to see that happening. And what I think has happened is the, the electron is not the basic unit of measurement that should be used. We need to get a smaller mass particle and build our, our progression with that. So we need to find out what is the mass of a neutrino. And physics is still undecided as to exactly what that mass is. They know it's somewhere around this number um, on 131. Item one here. Uh, that point zero 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 two six nine. It's somewhere. Yes, it's somewhere in that area. And but because we're counting loops, we 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 can know exactly what that number is. And uh, so that's the number. That uh, tiny fraction there is the mass value of an electron neutrino. So I'm taking that as base one because uh, it too has a fractional value because there's things going on below that. But as yet, science can't find any particle um, that is uh, well, I mean, they're looking for the Higgs particle, but it, it's still shaky ground there. And it, it it may become useful in in at some point when they really can isolate the value of it. But it is its mass is so small that uh, it's a fraction of a neutrino. And so it, what this is saying is let's let's count the number of neutrino masses that it takes to make an electron. And if you do that, the number that's presently being used um, for the, the mass value of an electron does not count the tiny little percent of mass that the neutrino is adding to it. So if you add in that little mass to the uh, 
electron base you're calling one. And let's see, can we go down further now? Stop at that page. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> let's see. If you add in that little bit of neutrino mass that the electron has to its base of one, and you <clears throat> multiply that by the number of loops it takes to make the proton, then the fractional value of the proton goes away. So what I'm saying here is that by studying the loops, we can know what the energy value of any particle is. And if we start at the smallest particle we can actually identify, which is the neutrino, and build, build according to the field structure hierarchy, we can end up with whole numbers for the different particles. And that's what uh, this part of the paper really talks about. Okay, shift down. Oops. Yeah, go back here. Okay, stop there. So let's take a look at that lambda hyperon that I talked about in the Zerpinski fractal as uh, having 2,187 loops. By the way, hyperon means larger than a proton. So any particle larger than a proton has this um, uh, name of hyperon added so you know what we're talking about. Uh, so if you start with that particle, and that particle, by the way, is not stable. It instantly, once it's created with electromagnetic energy, it decays. And it decays in this fashion. First, a meson is formed, which has 243 loops, which is one of the iterations of the, of the Zerpensky fractal. Then, the, then a beta electron comes off, which has 81 um, uh, electron masses. And finally, a neutrino takes out 27, and you end up with 1836, which is the proton mass. And um, it's interesting, this 81, because there are 81 stable elements of the 92 natural elements. The other 11 are radioactive and decay. So there's 81 that will hang around forever unless something inter interacts with them. And this is the beta electron that's in uh, a beta ray. This electron is too energetic to attach itself to an atom. And um, when the energy of an electron gets to that point, then it flies off and becomes a, a beta ray. And this is on the Zerpinski chart. You can see how that works. All right, carry down. Now, I, I find this, this, this diagram quite interesting. All right, stop there. Here's the Zerpinski fractal again. And these are the seven iterations. Oops. And so this is the lambda hyperon I was talking about, all 2,187 loops in it. Now, the proton has 800, eight, one, 1,836. So if you take off, if you count those, this is what it would look like. And the fact that you can find the proton in this uh, figure 12 is um, uh, a reassuring, but it's it doesn't have the symmetry we, we like in physics. But we have to remember that this is just a diagram. It's, it's not a structural model. Um, I, I call figure 13 the mountain range. And so why do proton, why did quark, 
proton loops have two loops of the same energy and another loop of a different energy. Their quarks are up, up quarks and down quarks make up all of uh, 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 matter in the first generation, which is the one we live in. And it has um, two up quarks, which are these two bottom triangles. And the upper, upper uh, quark only has this amount up in here. So uh, two up quarks designated as UU and one down quark D make up a proton. An up quark has 2.3 uh, million electron volts, and the down quark has um, 4.8. And if so, two up quarks together have 9.6, and the down has 2.3. And let's see, the two bottom iterations, I'm going to make this bigger so I can see it. The two bottom iterations have the same number of loops, 729, and, and combined have uh, 9.8 um, million electron volts while the smaller one, D, are composite of four iterations having 253 loops. Each up quark has a loop of 729 and a quark with the mass, uh, and th that quark would of uh, a down quark would have 378 loops. So, if you, if you, what is interesting is, is physics is wondering, well, why is the proton made of two big quarks and one little one? There's never been an explanation for that. And what I'm trying to show here is how to explain that in terms of loops. Um, I, I know you, <laughs> I imagine you can't figure out all of these numbers uh, jumbled around here, and um, the only the only ways to sit down and study this uh, to see how this is working out, and the whole purpose of the exercise is to show that we have a structural hierarchy that we can build on our kitchen table that tells us what the mass and energy values of particles are, and we don't, don't imply. And the math is is you know elementary. Uh, shift down, and if you want to get into this, uh, then you you really need to get the book. So uh, keep going, keep going down. There we go. All right. Uh, Can we get that whole thing? Yeah, there we go. What this does here is I've taken all the loops, the 836, 1,836 loops that are in the proton, and instead of arranging them in that triangle, I took one unit, that black little triangle there, and put around it 1,836 triangles, and this is the form I get. Now, this form has uh, quasi-symmetry. There are three three sides of this that have two more triangles in it than the other uh, three sides, and there's a reason for that. Um, but what we've got going here is symmetry, and this is what we have to have to have stable particles. We have to have this symmetry. And this, what this shows is all of these loops, these 1,836 loops, condense to that one loop in the center. 
And in other words, it, it condenses to a polyhedra at the center. And that polyhedra would have 1,836 faces. And so what, what this does is bring back symmetry to the operations that we're working on. And if it couldn't do that, then uh, we couldn't have a stable particle. Can you shift down now? Another page. Keep going. Yeah, hold it there. So here, the outside edge of this um, six-sided figure is the number of triangles that are in the lambda particle, 2,187. If you took out all the triangles out that are beyond what I defined as the proton, which is the inner line, you would have, um, you, you would see the difference between uh, a proton and a lambda. Now, a lambda is, as I mentioned, is not stable. It, it falls apart, and that's because it doesn't close. It doesn't have symmetry. As you can see, these this line ends at this point here. So this is showing the in the first generation, the only two particles that are stable is the electron, which is the center little triangle there, and the proton. And all the other uh, particles in that first generation, and now they've got up, there are over 100 different combinations. All of those are unstable. And they're produced in these cyclotrons where they smash particles together and then they look at all the debris and try to identify all these different particles. Shift down. Let's see. Okay, we've. Okay, now. Yeah, go down to the picture so we can get the pictures in there. All right. Um, here I'm I'm jumping back now to explain something about uh, the structure of these field structures. <clears throat> and I mentioned uh, in the beginning that a field structure is made of electromagnetic energy, which has two two circuits of energy that are opposite each other. They are clockwise and counterclockwise. So the strings that you see here on the left in that form are condensed, are a condensed side of the electromagnetic air. And this shows how, on the right, shows you how it condenses now, there's nothing to keep that condensed red loop from redeploying back over the entire loop until you interact three of these. Three of these on the right produces this form on the left. And this form electromagnetically holds together and does not allow the nuclear energy where all the frequency of the form is to redeploy over the uh, uh, the charge field lines here, these white lines. So this is how nature sequesters energy and keeps it from radiating out. And the, this process is called uh, syntropy as opposed to entropy. Entropy is where the condensed loop wants to redeploy and find stasis in the overall loop. But if you did that, you wouldn't have a universe. You just have a potential. So how nature confines the energy is in this structure, this field structure. Electromagnetically, what's happening is the condensed 
uh, loops, which are the colored strings, form a um, a closure around the electron. So what you've got here is a, a tiny little electric motor composed composed of three loops, and going through each of those colored loops is a, is the tube, which would be the trajectory of the electron part. And the colored loops is the magnetic field confining that electron. But whenever you have this configuration, that electron is propelled through the magnetic field. I mean, this is how a motor works. So this is a tiny little motor and it's it works three-dimensionally to perpetually uh, distribute energy, but it can't radiate that energy away because it is sequestered by the charge field around it. And I really like this description of why atoms and, and particles hold together. Why don't they explode? There's got to be a structural reason. And I think this is this is what's happening. Okay, go down. Let's see if I want to uh, keep going. All right. Um, this is more detailing about the energy values of the different particles and how they are uh, understood in as in the loop analytic uh, um, now in a electromagnetic loop which is that simple loop with two two loops wound together when when you condense one side of that loop and leave the other uh, deployed in nature, what happens is the electron, the I call one side of the electron uh, loop, electromagnetic loop, one side is the positron side and one side is the electron side. And uh, this is this is new. Uh, so when when the positron side condenses, uh, the positron side is a positive electron. The electron is a negative electron. When you condense the positron side to the dimensions of a nucleus, which is 100,000 times smaller in volume, the mass, the energy of that, uh, what you're doing is consolidating those loops tighter and tighter and tighter until you get to the... Uh, tight bound loopage of the nucleus, which is the quarks. And, and so an a, a atom, for instance, 99.94% of the energy of an atom is in the nucleus in that condensed form of the positron, uh, of, the, of, of the positive uh, wave. And only 0.06% is in the charge field. So that's that's um, a, a terrific uh, amount of energy that you're condensing into the nucleus. And what you're doing is you're collapsing a wave. And that that means the loops have to get tighter and tighter together for that collapse to occur. And uh, that, that's why an atom bomb based on fission has a much weaker explosion than a hydrogen bomb because in one, you're liberating electrons. In the other, you're liberating uh, the energy in a nucleus. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Well, let's drop down some more. 
hold it there. Oop. Let's go back up a little bit so we get that. There we go. <clears throat> All right, that's fine. Um, with the finding of the fractional value of the electron's charge field uh, to be that uh, uh, number, by down, down rating seven times using the architecture of the Zerpinski triangle fractal, uh, which divides by three with each iteration, the following table can be made. And these are the various numbers um, where you go from the first iteration to the seventh iteration. And you that's where you get the uh, uh, energy value of the neutrino. It, the interesting thing about nature is it's always a balance between volume and energy. So if you have a uh, a form like a, um, well, let's start with the quark, which is the highly condensed uh, form of electromagnetic energy. Um, and that has an enormous amount of energy in a tiny little space. And the next iteration up, is your electron, which has it lives in a larger space, but far less energy. And as you go from particle to atom, you're going from particle, you're talking about billions of electron volts, volts that it takes to break that thing apart because it's it's so tightly uh, compressed. So you're going from billions of electron volts at the particle level to millions of electron volts at the atomic level. And as you get bigger into the molecular platform of structure, you're finding that the um, binding energies are now in the thousands. And as you go from uh, molecules to cells, the binding energy goes down uh, to hundreds or less. And when you get to a human being, we start to decay, even if there is, uh, our binding energy is exceeded by just a few degrees. I mean, we, we normally live at a certain temperature, but if we go to 110, we're dead. You know, the, the, the trade-off is nature to exceed, Expand complexity and to organize in higher com complexes of form from particle, atom, molecule, cell. As you get these things bigger and bigger, that energy has to be distributed over a bigger area. And so the energy it takes to uh, destroy that or, or uh, interfere with that structure becomes smaller uh, the more complex the system becomes. And it's, I think that's, that's really uh, uh, interesting to me that uh, it's a trade-off between uh, energy and space. It's a time and space dilation that we're talking about and has, uh, you know, it has implications uh all along the way of like uh, uh, particles and atoms are immortal unless they're messed with by by some means. I mean, uh, they they last forever. No one knows how long a proton. They've tried to estimate how long a proton can live without decaying, and it's older than the universe uh, that we know of. So. At some point, nature gets to a place where the form can deteriorate. And that starts at the uh, molecular level. And the more complex the molecules forming cells and organisms and things like that, the more vulnerable that structure becomes. 
And uh, it would seem like if we start with a proton that can last forever and we end up with a human being that's got four score and 20 years uh, um, of longevity before it decays, how does how has nature figured out how to carry on these complex large organizations? <laughs> it does it by reproduction, by DNA, by reproducing the form over and over that uh, the form can endure in time. Um, not a particular form, but the form that that form produces. And, uh, uh, and, and you can see the process just coming right out of uh, the, the structural, physical understanding. Shift down. All right, here we come to something. Go, go to this chart, show this chart. Sure. I encourage everyone to take notes. Uh, <laughs> we're covering uh, quite a bit. Okay. Here I'm I'm trying to show how um, how loops mirror what's going on. Loop counting is mirroring, mirroring what's going on in physical experimental methods. So if if you take uh, an atom, uh, these are the different shells that an atom has. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven shells. In other words, the the electrons orbiting that nucleus comes in seven different shells. And the, the fact that uh, the fact that the energy of those different shells, like um, the first shell uh, of the electron has 500, uh, 0.511 million electron volts. That's the energy of a simple electron. And in the in its first or in the first orbit it has, and then in in an or in a shell that has nine loops, this would be the uh, you can see the number of loops versus what the energy is, and how these energies relate um, ratio wise is the same as the numbers of loops. Uh, are organized. So we've got a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the, the structure in loops and the structure in electron volts. And I think that, that, that this is really a convincing argument for me. Let's go down. Okay. Uh, hold it. Now, here we're comparing these uh, loop counts to electron volts. And we're seeing that each shell has this, this number for its um, for its energy. And at, at the first shell, it's the electron. And then as the shells go up, each shell has more energy. And after the seventh shell, there can't be any more energy in, there can't be an eighth shell because it's too, it has too much energy. And that's the, um, the uh, beta electron will just fly off and become a radiant particle. <clears throat> and this, this is uh, a relationship between showing that uh, the three loops, if you divide it in there, each loop would have this amount of energy. Uh, all right, let's go down. All right, let's hold it there. That one, Oop. come back. Can you go back up? Yep. There, okay. There we go. All right, 
right? So these are the number of loops. This is the energy in those loops because in e equals mc squared, the c squared number is the, uh, I call it the energy side, and the mass number are the number of loops. So, for instance, the lambda is 21, uh, 2,187 loops, and its energy is that number squared. So that's the energy of a the number of twists in that structure. And every 360-degree rotation of that line uh, in this form represents another unit of energy. And what's interesting here is at this 81 level loops, which is the same number of loops in this fractal, the whole thing it, up to here, uh, is the maximum amount of uh, energy that can be found in the fifth iteration. And beyond that, uh, the next step is the muon, the electron muon, and then the ta muon. So again, here I'm showing how the loop structure and the energy structures are the same and generate each other and confirm each other. All right, let's go on down further. Uh, uh, I kind of covered that. Let's go beyond. Oops, there we go. So here's here's a chart that I've been working on. This is not complete at all, but it's where I was at when I wrote this particular thing. Is uh, here's the particle name that physics gives different particles, and this is the number of loops in that particle. And it, for instance, the uh, uh, the ta neutrino is three Lark loops, which is three electron neutrinos. And neutrinos don't have a rest state. Let's go down to uh, <clears throat> the muon. The muon has 207 uh, uh, loops. And if you look at the triangle at the Zerpinski fractal, you can see which units of that fractal go together to make that up. Um, and here, here, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to show that within the Zerpinski fractal, you can find the combination of iterations of that fractal that go into making up all these different particles here. Uh, further showing that we're talking about loop structures when we're talking about particles. All right, let's go down. Oh, here I'm showing a deployed ring, two rings. There's the red ring and the black ring. And when you condense them, <clears throat> notice how you get one rotation. That red line rotates one time in going around this form. Whereas here, it went around the form, half the number of nodes here are red. And... So when this condenses, all you have shown here are the black ones. These are the black loops. And all the red one up here becomes this loop. So you could ask, well, what happened to the, the nodes, the twist of this form when it condensed? And what happens is the length of this of the red loop here is, le is lesser than the length of this loop here, if you measured them. So you're trading, you're trading energy for volume. And when you do this um, condensing it, 
All right, let's go down. I've shown that. Let's keep going. There are different views of those forms. The the plenum. Stop, let's just go back for a moment. You know, I'm going to have to take a little break to take. Uh, sure. Get some water here. Sure. I'm going to no take, problem. You've been speaking uh, for three, quite a while, so. Break. Okay. Yeah. So why don't, why don't we take a three minute break? Um, and you know what? Why don't we take some questions when we come back? Okay. Uh, it's current. And then, uh, so I'm going to stop to share. Uh, so, uh, folks, this is your opportunity. We're going to give Don a break here uh, for the next two or three minutes. Um, it's time for you. You, you can uh, prepare your questions. Uh, either type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, but if anybody has, uh, actually, if anybody has a comment that they wish to share um, before Don gets back, uh, why don't you go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat and, and uh, maybe share for one or two minutes. Would anybody like to share? Okay, so I think what we're going to do here is, um, there we go, uh, Mike, uh, we have Mike and I see uh, Roy as well. So just one to two minutes in Elena, uh, one to two minutes, uh, if you can go ahead and share your your observations and then we can, uh, when Don comes back, we can start with the questions. Uh, Mike, go right ahead. Now you're on mute, Mike. Uh, I vaguely understand uh, the representation, and it sounds a little bit better than chemistry shells that we learned in uh, high school. But I don't understand how it would be used for, say, computing tunneling probabilities or state transitions but, or things like that. So if this if it's a question, um, then how perhaps be, you may be how would you how would you intend to use this? Well, we'll, we'll when Don returns, we, we can pose that question uh, to him. I'm That's just opening it up for the next. Okay. Uh, well. Okay. You put your put your hand back up uh, once he returns, and you can go ahead and ask him that question. Uh, so, Roy, do you have a comment? Other questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Joe. Um, I was I viewed a little short YouTube uh, that Don presented, so I could familiarize, and I saw, and uh, uh, I was very impressed with um, uh, tetrahedral uh, understandings. I have not heard anything about the the power of the tetrahedron in this presentation, and so what I'm curious about is is there a way in which this information, this this uh, physics can translate to the scale of organic and human relations that involve this tetrahedral wisdom? Again, so uh, that would be a question for Don. Yeah. Um, that is a very interesting question. Uh, and I um, am looking forward to that answer, uh, but uh, Right now, just maybe if we can uh, share comments. And the reason I'm asking everyone to share comments is because perhaps it may spur uh, an idea or a question and that someone else has. Although Don is back. So Don, <laughs> our welcome back. So we've had uh, you know a couple of comments and a couple of people raise their hands. So I am going to ask them to Mike and Roy to go ahead and uh, pose their questions again, and then um, we will uh, go to uh, Jeannie after that. So, uh, Mike, feel free to unmute. Um, okay. Uh, uh, 
I sort of understand how this works. And it's a nice, it seems like a nice compact res, uh, um, uh, uh, representation uh, as compared to chemistry shells that we learned in high school. Uh, but what I don't understand is how uh, you would use this. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm used to, I, I do sort of understand Feynman diagrams and how you would uh, uh, be able to know uh, tunneling probabilities or state change probabilities. Uh, uh, the uh, energy things that you computed uh, uh, that you had on the charts, uh, you, you didn't use this technique to get them. You, you use classical techniques to get those uh, electron volt levels. Uh, and uh, uh, how would you use this to compute probabilities of, say, state change or, or um, other things like that? Well, um... Probabilities is, to me, the, the result of not having the proper structural hierarchy to look at. So when, when uh, probabilities came up because they couldn't figure out where a particle was uh, at any given time, and if they stopped it, they no longer knew what the... Uh, momentum of it was. So you have position and momentum uh, that can't be known simultaneously. And the only way to deal with it was probabilities, which says it's probably here more than there. And they found that these probabilities matched uh, the energy values of particles when they uh, isolated them in these different shells. So what field structure does is uh, instead of the uncertainty principle, it advances the idea of, of multiple certainties and thereby determinism comes back to physics that had been dismissed uh, in the world of quantum mechanics because it was determinism couldn't be found. So that's why they went to probabilities. So how does multiple certainty principle uh, solve the problem of where something is at any particular energy level? And it solves it not only vaguely as a probability, but exactly where it is. And here's, if we look at this model, it's the tetrahedron is the nucleus. And we find that there are four places where these loops interact. Those are the places where you're going to find the electron in this field, in the simplest of all fields. Now, as you get more complex, like uh, some of these structures you're seeing, I have hung up there on the wall, they're all, um, each polyhedral form that is the nuclear um, uh, result of these interacting loops produces different arrangements of where these fields interact. And that those different places are the multiple certainties of where you'll find that particle. You won't find the particle here, out here. Oops you'll find it where they intersect, there and there. There are four places it intersects in the tetrahedron. And there's 20 places it intersects in the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. So every form um, has its unique number of places where the, all the lines converge, all the energy in the, in the form converge at a, at a place that's where you find the particle. And the combinations of this are just astounding. And um, these mechanical models that I made here, it's just so, just such a tip of the iceberg. And it really needs to be uh, developed on a computer, which uh, there's two people that are working on that now. Uh, one is, uh, 
Greg Volk in Minnesota, and the other fella is uh, Gary Doskis in Massachusetts. And they're getting this put into a computer form, which is the only way to study it beyond just the simple mechanical forms that I'm building here. I'm can, I ask, uh, can I ask a variant uh, of that question, well, well, uh, now that you mentioned that? Well, my, what what um, kind of problem would you solve, uh, would you use this for? Well, uh, if you know where things are, you mean the problem of multiple certainties? Who who's asking the question? Uh, it was Mike uh, again as well. Okay, okay. I had Mike. Uh, uh, just really quickly follow up because we okay. have a number. What, of what if you if you're trying to design, a, say, a, a, a doping strategy for a junction? How would you would you use this approach to uh, understand uh, how the uh, particles are connected? Uh, definitely. Uh, what you can do now is designer uh, architecture of, in, in terms of chemistry and uh, molecular uh, science, you now have a more accurate way of finding where things are. And instead of working with probabilities, you're working with multiple certainties. So your degree of exactitude becomes greater. Um, I, uh, I, I showed, uh, in the first presentation, since we're talking molecules, let me get a form here. Let's see if I can get this in. I don't know if you can see this or not, but uh, this is a molecular platform of loop structure. And here's a tetrahedron, and here's another one. So these are two atoms that are linked together. And uh, depending on the orientation of these two, they can be linked together with a single loop or multiple loops, three. And this, another, th this is actually the, the, the valence electron circuitry of uh, two atoms linked together. In this case, it would be uh, two hydrogen uh, atoms. But what you see here is now that you know where the energy is actually going, uh, this being the axis of that energy, it's kind of a ball, but this is the axis of the energy that has to go and it has to weave itself in exactly the right way handedness speaking, you know exactly what that form looks like. And you would also have uh, an exact way of knowing if you're going to modify that form, what you have to do to do that. So I, I think that would, that would be a great asset in uh, chemistry to have that ability. Thank you for that. Uh, and that is one thing that is interesting about this is that how many fields it applies to. So folks, we actually have a number of people in the queue that will first, uh, we'll go with Roy, then we'll follow it by Jeannie, then uh, Elena uh, and Chad uh, after that. Um, so Don, thank you uh, for this presentation. Um, my question is going to shift from subatomic particle physics uh, to the scale of of human relations and and organic relations in the natural ecology. Good. Um, I I watched uh, one of your YouTubes and and I was reminded. I'm re of course I, I know about Buckminster Fuller from years ago, and uh, and I love this notion of the structural stability of tetrahedrons. And so that's that's where I'm coming from. Uh, but I'm coming from it, not from subatomic physics, but from understanding the scale of things in, in human relations and human relations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the natural world around us. And I'm just wondering if you have any, any ways in which you can translate this subatomic wisdom to the realm uh, that I was just naming. Um, is that possible? That's 
that's really where I want this to go. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> more interested. I, I'm, I explore this uh, subatomic and particle down in there only to get straight about what structure actually is, what's really going on. But what I want to do is be able to ratchet that up, iterate that up to the human scale mm -hmm. so that the structural relationships that we form at the human level are based on solid structural principles and are not just willy fairy uh, happenstance. Mm -hmm. And to give structure to uh, uh, human affairs, be it politics, economics, uh, uh, whatever it is, is I feel what's really missing in our uh, the conduct of our affairs is we don't know what the hell we're doing. We we do things and wait for the, for nature to tell us whether we blew it or we got it right, and that's because we don't know what the structure really is. You know, we we build things and put things together without really knowing its structure, and so. Thank you for asking that question, because to me, um, st structure has to get beyond the formative level at the, at the micro scale, and it has to get into our macro scale. And for us to have a cosmology that's really working, it has to be able to be working at the cosmological scale as well. And I, I just finished a, a book and uh, this has been worked on since 2016, where I'm trying to put all this together. And you'll find that the book is heavily influenced by metaphysics, as it is physics. I see those two as working together. And the only way we're going to get our problem solved, I feel, is with the... Uh, bringing the synergetics of physics and metaphysics together uh, will um, really help us along a lot. And I, I feel we're stuck right now and physics is stuck. It hasn't had a breakthrough in 50 years. And uh, there's been interesting books coming out recently that's talking about that particular problem that they've hit a wall and they don't know how to get through it. And I think structure Going back and taking a look at Fuller and Snelson and, and uh, these guys whose shoulders I stand on uh, to see how important structure is and that it really does uh, provide something that physics just hasn't had. And uh, so, again, thanks for that question. That's where I wanted to go. If, if I may, I'd like to just name two people and, and 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 show you why I'm asking this. The two people are William Blake, Fourfold Vision, and and uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan and his notion oh. of, the, of the tetrads. Notice the fours. See it, it and there's a there's something about fourness uh, as a as a as a mode of perceiving and understanding, and that's why I'm asking this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very influenced by uh, Marshall McLuhan, too. I, when I read his book, I thought, wow, he's really touched into something here. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, th there's there's a, just a lot of people that have latched on to certain aspects of this whole idea of structure. And um, another realm of structure that I'm finding really interesting is... Um, uh, something called um I can't think of it an Australian fellow it's it's like uh, uh swarm intelligence is what they kind of call it and there there's a book called swarm intelligence and it to me it it illustrates the need for uh studying how nature works in in totalities in holisms and and uh it's it's much more effective in in uh in 
solving problems holistically, then it's like uh, taking a, a watch, uh, taking a, uh, a watch apart and laying all the parts on the table. If you don't know what a watch looks like, those parts will never come together in your mind. So you start with the holism and then all the parts will make sense. And that's our problem. We we're, we're so detailed and, and uh, preoccupied with the parts, what I call partism, that we fail to step back and say, what's the holism here? And then we then when we know the holism, we can we can get rid of all the other things that aren't necessary because we know what belongs. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, so next we will go to Jeannie. That was a great exchange. I appreciate that. Actually, I was going to um, answer Roy's question according to what Don had already said, and um, so. For the tetrahedron, it's the first form where the loops can support uh, a con condensed forms. So before that, everything flies apart. And with yeah. the tetrahedron, yeah. they they lock in place so that you can have actually um, yeah. permanent or, or lasting energy held. Well, yes, I intuited that. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Don. To answer Jeannie's question there, the because we're dealing with fields, and I haven't mentioned this enough, um, if you put the field around any form, say the cube, which is not structural, but you add the field to it, it becomes structural. Okay. So the tetrahedron is not the only structure in the universe, but all structures, I mean, look around. Um, from cosmos to particle, very few tetrahedrons are around. What is the important issue is the field, because it's the field that organizes the energy into a equilibrium that 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 it wants to preserve. And the field that's why this is called field structure theory, because the field is the mechanism for creating form in mm -hmm. uh, our universe. So, you know, yeah. in, in fuller, excuse me, go ahead. No, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, so. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I just wanted to point out that the, in, in uh, Fuller's book, Synergetics 1 and 2, he, he states that the tetrahedron is the only form that's structural. And coming from a, a macro mechanical scale of structure, that's true, but it doesn't account for what's going on in the micro scale or the cosmic scale where you don't find tetrahedrons. Mm -hmm. um, and what you find are fields, that it's actually fields that are holding together this solar system and whether it's a gravity field or an electromagnetic field, and the same thing for particles. It's the field that that uh, can structure all of this stuff. So uh, in the beginning, we, we called this form, Stanley Wasaki and I discovered this together one night in 1965, and we, we were calling it a torsion field, which it is, but the word uh, field, tor we call it torsion structure, but the word field seemed to give it more um, uh, adaptability to explain a wider experience. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, I think that this is a, one of the more important points is that um, the tetrahedron is not just a form. Uh, is that it, you know you're looking at the underlying energy patterns, and that's why the loops are actually so important because they actually help bring structure to that. If I'm understanding that correctly, exactly. So, so we will go to uh, Elena next. Uh, Elena, feel free to mute and uh, ask your question. Then Chad. Great, thank you, Don. 
um, for the presentation. And uh, my question is, what you've mentioned is that nature and life force increases complexity and organizes itself into more complex structures. And then you've mentioned it increases fragility of the system. So I wanted to ask you, did I, is, is that correct? That's what you were meaning. And how do we, how do we maintain stability of the system in spite of increasing complexity? It's the first question. And second question, um, the time. Where do you see time in this um, matter energy field? Um, say uh, concept or paradigm. What time does do to to everything that that's there? Okay, uh, challenging questions. Uh, yes, the. The first question, if, if if I heard you right, is a question about um, as complexity develops in structure, uh, uh, what, 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 say it again now. <laughs> um, um, as it, yes. Does it become more uh, unstable, essentially, as it becomes more complex? Uh, so that's what she's asking. And how do you then make it stable? Well, in spite uh, of complexity, in spite of it grows and say like um, a society, we were hunting giraffes and mammoths. And then now we have uh, a grocery stores and, and say Amazon. How do we maintain stability of the system in spite of increasing complexity in the structure? Oh, okay. What happens with that? You said the energy also needs to be somehow redistributed or given away. So just again, this this what came to me. Uh, structure in in the macro scale, which is the one we work in day in day out, uh, by by understanding the the bedrock principles of structure um, you can walk into uh, any situation or uh, confront any situation uh, by analyzing where the loops of of energy that are forming that that uh, situation um, what do you look for in understanding it? And in every situation, you're always dealing with tension and compression. And the combination of them being torsion, put those two together as torsion. <clears throat> so every structure has opposites interacting, or it's not a structure. So in 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 this simple form here, I have three loops that have been stressed by being bent, and they want to resume a a uh, circular uh, form that doesn't have stress. And yet, because these things are interacting, three of them in three dimensional space, um, what's happening is those energies that are pushing out are restrained by the energies pulling in tension and compression. And what I've been trying to train myself to do is to look at a situation in terms of that which is expanding and that which is contracting. And, and the situation is only resolved when these two become balanced. If one becomes greater than the other, we're in the, the situation's in trouble. And uh, politics is a great way to look at this. <laughs> um, uh, I have a, uh, a, a thumbnail uh, view on, on this, and it's, um, it expresses the tension and compression relationship that goes to make 
our society uh, work or not work. And if either tension or compression gets out of out of control, then the system has got to change in order to reestablish balance. And you might not like the way it, it has to go, but nature in this climate change world is readjusting to this new energy that's being pumped into it. And um, it's a, a simple consequence of what we're doing in our complete ignorance of, uh, of the structure involved. So in, in America, I see there's two things going on. There's those that, they're, they're the Americans that say, I belong to America. And then there's others that say, America belongs to me. And there's your tension and compression. And the only way we're going to live through this is to find the balance between these two. It's not that you've got to destroy one and leave the other. Uh-uh. You've got to find the balance between these two. And um, so looking at the macro scale where we live today to day, the question is always, where's equilibrium here? And and then do what is necessary on your part to uh, answer that. I don't know. The the but, second question you asked was time, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Time is 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 a, another really good one, and uh, I'm not going to be able to explain that tonight. Uh, that should be a whole other program. <laughs> well, space, you know what? Maybe uh, we'll. That's that's fine. I think we can come back to that. I, I think that that's a very you know, can be a topic onto itself. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, so would you say that using your theory, you're able to analyze the causes of things as opposed, you know, you're able to kind of so you there un, you're understanding the structures much better, the interactions between the structures uh, much better. Is that a way of understanding it? Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a way of of understanding it, but I, I'm not so I'm a little worried about the word cause. Um, mm -hmm. Cause can come from many places, and the actions that result from those causes. Uh, I mean, you can deal with what actually happens, but uh, to deal with the cause is much more difficult problem because it, it or to understand it so i was thinking about looking at it from a field perspective but that's okay uh let's go on to uh chat uh thank you um i think um a lot of the discussion so far has been um kind of leading towards um one general um word or term that might be helpful here on a social sense and also a physical sense. Uh, I was wondering if the theory um, had accounted for um, tolerance and um, that could be a potential solution to the, the determinant problem and the, the fact that we know that nature is not perfect. Um, that things can be chaotic and there's always that battle of equilibrium of tension and compression that a little bit is going to make a change. Um, you know, whether that change is controllable or not is, um, you know, uh, up, up to um, debate, you know, but um, if you're, if you don't have tolerance in your system, if your gears are milled perfectly, the, mesh together perfectly they're they're just going to bind right up um so it, it does your theory account for any of that tolerance and, and slop in the system uh tolerance that, that, all right okay that that brings up another issue to me uh when i trying to accommodate that word tolerance into things <clears throat> a a field structure has a great deal of tolerance. In other words, I can squeeze this thing all kinds of ways, but it's gonna pop right back to 
the form it wants to be. And um, the uh, a lot of forms that we deal with are intolerant. I mean, even architecturally, what happened in Afghanistan yesterday and killed thousands of people was the fact that they're building their their buildings unstructurally so that any little jiggle and it's gone. Uh, tolerance to me would be building my relationship with the world in a way that can handle inputs and outputs of energy without without destroying either myself or anybody else. Um, so, you know, nature builds tolerance. I mean, like a live tree can bend and blow in the wind and everything like it was today, but a dead tree has no tolerance. It's going to break. It doesn't bend anymore. And so change is, change is really what fuel structures are all about, even though I haven't even mentioned the word till now, but it's the ability to take in energy incorporated into your structure if it is a type of energy that is resonant with your your energies and if it isn't then just let it pass and uh, don't let it stick don't don't present an obstacle to that energy just let it go this is what atoms do all the time atoms are have certain frequencies which spectrum analysis can can has shown us and those few bands of uh frequency in the loops are responsible for keeping that atom whole and keeping its integrity and all the other frequencies that are flying about just go right through and right out the other end. They don't stick. And that that's why when we look at something, we're seeing all the rays, all the bands of energy coming from that form that are not the form. They're the they're the the vibrations that the form doesn't want. And this to me was a shocking realization that, oh my God. Granny was right when she says, uh, uh, don't judge a book by its cover, because the what we are, we can't, you know, our basic energy and the way we basically have put ourselves together is uh, a structure having certain frequencies that we figured out works, and we've got rid of those frequencies, hopefully, that uh, interfere with our performance. And that to me is, is a form of tolerance because when energy comes that doesn't work with my system, I'd, I've, I'm trying to train myself not to let it affect me, just let it pass through. Someone calls me a donkey, I don't grow a tail, you know, that kind of thing. So tolerance is is a very strategic uh, attitude to have. And I think structures have that ability. Thank you for Thank that, you. Don. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask Don? Don, I know it's uh, past 10 o'clock. Uh, it's past 10 o'clock hour here on the East Coast. Um, I you know, would uh, I don't see anybody with their uh, hands up, um, but, uh, and I'm seeing gratitude in the chat. Um, uh, I too am grateful and I am very hopeful that you will uh, return to maybe address the, uh, the uh, question about time. I think that that would be interesting. And I would really like to see once the computer models actually you know, are, are completed. I don't know what the timetable is on that, uh, but I think that that could be really interesting for us to to explore here. 
um, because it's a, it really is a fascinating topic. Well, I, I could give you a list and uh, of uh, websites you could go to to see what's being done on that level. Oh, like great. To uh, Shrikant. And, That'd uh, be great. You could distribute it the way he wants. But um, again, I, 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 this is a very clumsy attempt to try to explain uh, field structure theory and Yet, I mean, I I really feel that um, uh, this is just the next step of things that Fuller and Snelson, you know, began, and there's plenty of more steps to take. And I I just love it when I that on our Field Structure Institute we get people that are making presentations from all over the world who are working on this question of structure, and. I see it coming together in a way that uh, is going to be much more profound than than just one guy working by himself. So this is this is a group effort, and um, and I would like to encourage anyone that's interested in getting involved to uh, check it out through uh, uh, Field Structure Institute. And we have weekly meetings on uh, each Saturday morning, ten to twelve on Mighty Networks, Field Structure Institute on Mighty Networks, where we have people come and um, give us their research and what they've been doing. And that's a weekly event. Yeah, I, I am all, actually. I really appreciate all, all of you coming and listen to this and hope it meant something. It absolutely did. And I mean, we uh, I know that we're grateful here and I am going to post uh in the chat uh the website for i just want to make sure i have the right uh website that uh here because it seems to be coming up as geometric geometric uh structures laboratory would that be correct field structure institute or mighty networks under and then once you're into that go to field structure institute or structural physics too. Um, okay. Here we go. And so I'm going to post this in the chat, and hopefully some people will take it you up on your meetings uh, on at 10 a.m. on uh, Saturday and. You know, I, I think it would be fantastic if you came back here as well. Uh, so, um, Don, can't thank you enough for, for being here this evening. It uh, means a great deal to uh, myself and I know to Shri Khan, uh, who was just traveling this uh, this weekend. So, he, unfortunately, he could not be here. Um, but I know he'll listen to the video. Uh, and I know that he was so excited last time after having uh we you know you as a guest that the next day he actually hosted his own meetup uh and trying to explain some of the same concepts so uh it really is it really it does mean a lot to us and so uh I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you again um and uh and i'll just do uh from there just some uh, quick announcements that, that's coming up this week uh we have uh poetic mondays tomorrow uh, and Maritza will be leading that. Uh, we'll, we're reading the Analytics uh, Analects of Confucius. That is, uh, we're on chapter 14, and that is on Tuesday at 8 o'clock. Um, and we will be, uh, we'll have comprehensive, comprehensive this Wednesdays. I believe that it's this Wednesday we're comparing three different thinkers. I do not know who those three thinkers are. And um, Thursday is... Uh, the Poetics by Aristotle, The Birth of Aesthetics. And uh, and Friday will be Medina uh, by Euripides. So it's a really interesting week here. Um, you know, Donna, it's a, it, I was looking back at some of the things that you'd said about how your your uh, some of your uh, your spiritual journey has influenced your work. Um, I think that could be a meetup into itself, onto itself. It really is. But I mean, you know, how the, the insights that you gained um, uh, and looking at things from a, a cosmic perspective. 
Uh, and I think that this really is a cosmic perspective uh, to geometry, uh, truly a cosmic perspective. So um, yeah, maybe at some point you can come back and share those thoughts with us as well. Uh, delighted. But, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody uh, has a wonderful week and that I see all of you soon. Have a good evening. Great.